Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of Lynchpin, Are You Dispensable? How to Drive Your Career and Create a Remarkable Future by Seth Godin. So I've read a bunch of Seth Godin books before, probably about 12 of them or so. I will read you the blurb from this. It's quite a long one, so strap yourself in. Seth Godin's powerful new book is all about you, your choices, your future, and your potential to make a huge difference in whatever field you choose. There used to be two teams in every workplace, management and labour. Now there's a third team, the linchpins. These people invent, lead, regardless of title, connect others, make things happen and create order out of chaos. They figure out what to do when there's no rule book. They love their work and pour their best selves into it. Linchpins are the essential building blocks of great organisations and in today's world, they get the best jobs and the most freedom. Have you ever found a shortcut that others missed? Seen a new way to resolve a conflict? Made a connection with someone others couldn't reach, even once? then you have what it takes to become indispensable. It's time to stop complying with the system and draw your own map. Only you can do it, and you must. Seth Godin is the author of Tribes, The Dip, Purple Cow, All Marketers Are Liars, and other international bestsellers that have changed the way business people think and act. He's the most influential business blogger in the world. He's also the founder and CEO of Squidoo.com and a very popular speaker. So, my thoughts on this. This is kind of outdated in a way, but also the concepts in it don't really age so it's it's really just the references that are outdated like it says only a couple of years ago you couldn't have gone on twitter and done this and it's like well actually twitter's been around for like 10 years now another problem that i kind of noticed with it but could get over but i've seen other people in the reviews they weren't so kind is that it it gets kind of repetitive at times so there are kind of a few core concepts but they're kind of stretched out throughout the whole book and even when i was reading it it took me longer to read than it should have based on how long it usually takes me to read a book of, I think, like 240 pages or so. However, I mean, I did enjoy it. I've, I always enjoy Seth Godin, really. Some of his books are better than others. This one was okay. Um, I find it quite hard to really tell you what the book is about. It doesn't give you a roadmap or anything like that, any steps you can follow, and, and Godin kind of argues that that's not really a thing, and I, I agree with him there. Like, it is much more, in this in this book, it is much more about a philosophy that Godin has to share with us. I'm going to flick through and pick out some of the different bits. There are lots of these little um, illustrations inside, which I, which I quite like. So, we've got here, job description, automation, doom, where they overlap. And I guess the idea here is, it becomes even more relevant today when you look at things like AI and uh, robots and things like that, that are actually really starting to get pretty good now. If you do a job that's just following orders and just doing what you're told to do, you will eventually be replaced. So the only way to really future-proof yourself is to become a linchpin, you know, is to become this kind of, uh, this person that does what it takes, does whatever needs to be done. And you, you don't, the idea behind a linchpin is that they don't just need to be told what to do. They don't need to be micromanaged. I like this as well, and this, this section here kind of reminds me of why I'm glad that I've gone freelance and gone self-employed. So he says, an exceptional performer earns you $30 for every hour he works. A good employee is worth $25 an hour, and a mediocre worker can contribute about $20 an hour in profit. If you can't tell who's mediocre and who's exceptional when you do the hiring, and you want to pay everyone a standard rate, how much should you pay? Well, other than as little as possible, the answer is certainly less than $25 an hour, probably less than $20 an hour. You want every employee to make money, even the mediocre ones which means that all your other employees are getting paid less to make up for the ones who contribute the least. The exceptional performers are getting paid a lot less, which is why they should, and will, leave. Exceptional performers are starting to realise that it doesn't pay to do factory work at factory wages only to subsidise the boss. I thought this was funny here as well, because this demonstrates different ways of thinking, I guess. Because he says, um, Answering questions like, when was the War of 1812, is a useless skill in an always-on Wikipedia world. It's far more useful to be able to answer the kind of questions for which using Google won't help. Questions like, what should I do next? But I'm there like, well, the War of 1812 was in 1812. That's all you need to know. But I agree, you can also go, hey Google, when was the War of 1812? The War of 1812's dates are from the 18th of June 1812 to the 18th of February 1815. So it, it, what, 1812 wasn't even the answer, so there we go. What, here's one of the things that, that dates it a bit. It, uh, it says here, Marissa Meyer, what can she do that you can't? 
Marissa has created billions of dollars worth of value in her time at Google, yet she's not the key brain in the programming department, nor is she responsible for finance or even public relations. Marissa is a linchpin. She applies artistic judgement combined with emotional labour. She makes the interfaces work, the user interface and the interface between the engineers and the rest of the world, and leads the people who gets things done. Which is funny because she doesn't work at Google anymore, she became the CEO of Yahoo. This isn't the Marissa Meyer who wrote uh, Cinder, by the way. That confused me. That's, this has always been something that's kind of bugged me about BookTube, is that people talk about Marissa Meyer. And I knew before BookTube was a thing, I knew who Marissa Meyer was. So it's not, and then suddenly I've start, discovered BookTube or whatever, and everyone's talking about Marissa Meyer, and I'm like, no. We have here, Bob Dylan knows a little about becoming indispensable, being an artist and living on the edge. So he said, Daltrey, Townsend, McCartney, The Beach Boys, Elton, Billy Joel. They made perfect records, so they have to play them perfectly, exactly the way people remember them. My records were never perfect, so there is no point in trying to duplicate them. Anyway, I'm no mainstream artist. I like this bit here as well, we'll read this out. Ray Simmons coined the phrase, and I like it a lot. Most artists can't draw. We need to add something, but all artists can see. We can see what's right and what's wrong. We can see opportunities and we can see around corners. Most of all, we can see art. Art isn't only a painting. Art is anything that's creative, passionate and personal. And great art resonates with the viewer, not only with the creator. What makes someone an artist? I don't think it has anything to do with a paintbrush. There are painters who follow the numbers, or paint billboards, or work in a small village in China painting reproductions. These folks, while swell people, aren't artists. On the other hand, Charlie Chaplin was an artist beyond a doubt. So is Jonathan Ive, who designed the iPod. You can be an artist who works with oil paints or marble, sure, but there are artists who work with numbers, business models, and customer conversations. Art is about intent and communication, not substances. An artist is someone who uses bravery, insight, creativity, and boldness to challenge the status quo and an artist takes it personally. I like this thought as well, which is something, I don't know, when, when, when we look at selling our time, basically, which is what artists have to do, it's what I do as a freelancer, you know? And um, so he writes here, a day's work for a day's pay. I hate this approach to life, it cheapens us. The simple formula bothers me for two reasons. One, are you really willing to sell yourself out so cheap? Do you mortgage an entire irreplaceable day of your life for a few bucks? The moment you are willing to sell your time for money is the moment you cease to be the artist you're capable of being. Number two, is that it? Is the transaction over? If we're even at the end of the day, as the formula says, then you owe me nothing and I owe you nothing in return. If we're even, then there is no bond, non no ongoing connection between us. There is a moment when he talked about tofu though, and he was like, perhaps the reason you can't name a beloved brand of tofu is that no artist has bothered to market to you yet. Cauldron tofu, man, I love cauldron tofu. They pre-season it and everything. Some artists work to change themselves. The process of making the art and the results produced are solely aimed at the creator. Whistling as you walk through the woods is a form of art, but you're not doing it hoping a squirrel will applaud. Most of us, though, most of the time, make our art for an audience. We want to change someone else. We're seeking to make them happier or more engaged or a customer. I do like that thought about, you know, when you whistle in the, in the woods, though, or when you sing in the shower, sometimes just creating something or you know singing or whatever you want to do sometimes you just do it for the sake of it he talks about demons as well spelled d-a-e-m-o-n he says demon is a greek term the romans called it a genius the greeks believed that the demon was a separate being inside each of us the genius living inside of us would struggle to express itself in art or writing or some other endeavor when the genius felt like showing up great stuff happened if not you were sort of out of luck but I like that because it relates back to Demons in Northern Lights by Philip Pullman, my favourite book. So there we go. He does say, I, I disagree with this. He says, uh, anxiety is needless and imaginary. It's fear about fear. Fear that means nothing. I kind of get what he's saying, but I don't like the way that he said it. He talks as well about getting attached to things we can't control. So, um, for example, let's say your bus is late or something like that. Something that you can't change yourself, and it's it's a waste of our mind's energy to kind of focus on that stuff when we should be focusing on the stuff we can change. I like this. This is interesting as well, where it talks about because a lot of the time I think our society we have this kind of myth that we have to just work constantly, hustle, 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 you know. And uh, I think Godin gets it right here. He says, "Will working more hours make you a better artist? Does painting more pictures help? Writing more words? Inventing more inventions? To a point." But most of the time, that's not what we do. Most of the time, we're doing non-linchpin work, doing someone else's work instead of our art. 
That's fine, as long as there's a balance, as long as you leave enough time for the work that matters. The resistance encourages you to avoid the work, and our society rewards busy work as well. Serious artists distinguish between the work and the stuff they have to do when they're not doing the work. The idea being, yeah, we can work harder at the work, but if we're just working harder at answering our emails or whatever, you know, it's only going to get us so far. This is another one of the little charts here. So we've got eats brains, turns friends into monsters. You must escape it. And in the center, bureaucracy or zombies. Take your pick. So yeah, that's about all I want to highlight from Lynchpin, Are You Indispensable by Seth Godin. It's rating time. I'm going to give it a 4 out of 5. If anything, it's a low 4 out of 5, maybe a 3.75. But uh, for the purposes of Goodreads and this review and whatnot, we'll give it a 4. It's pretty good. It's not Godin's best. But, you know, if it sounds interesting to you, then go ahead and check it out. So there we have it, that's what I thought of Lynchpin by Seth Godin, don't forget to let me know in the comments if you've read this book and if so what you thought of it, hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit subscribe for more, and I will see you soon for another one, thanks a lot, bye bye.